So, facing the unknown. We all know what it means to face the unknown. But just what is the unknown? What is facing the unknown? You see, every unknown situation is different. But there is a common reaction to it. And the reaction is that terrible feeling in the depths of your body when your stomach feels that it's dropped below your boots and your mouth goes dry and you break out in a cold sweat and this of course is the physiological reaction of our bodies to stark naked fear what am I supposed to do? Now often when this kind of situation happens there's no mum or dad to talk to you're on your own facing the unknown and you know it's unknown precisely because there is no immediate advice on what to do. You have to decide what to do. And like a cat with its eyes shining and reflecting the blinding headlights of an oncoming vehicle, there is no time to waste. Quick, snap, decision. This way or that way, immediately one way or the other. Standing still is not an option. Now, my first piece of advice is this. Welcome the experience of facing the unknown because this is the kind of life experience that can help you to build your character for success in the future. So let's think a minute about how others did it. Ask yourself the questions. What distinguishes high-level success? What enables high flyers like Einstein or Leonardo da Vinci or Charles Darwin? What enabled them to succeed? The answer is very simple. They also had to learn to face the unknown. Now, of course, you can't face the unknown if you also don't know anything. So you need to study, you need to learn things. Very much so. Of course, you also need to mature in knowledge of the world and how it works. But knowledge and educational maturity on their own are not sufficient because the high flyers are those who have dared to face the unknown. Let's take as an example Einstein and his imagination of relativity because Einstein did exactly that facing the unknown when he had the idea of relativity it was a leap of imagination to think that space and time might not be what we thought they were because people before Einstein thought that there had to be something in space that makes space. A kind of invisible wind through which we move. People even called it the ether. Now if there was an ether in space, even if we could not see it, 
it would make a difference whether we move with the ether or against it, just like travelling with the wind or against the wind. But Einstein knew for a famous experiment that light travels at the same speed in all directions. It didn't depend on whether it was moving with the wind or against the wind. Yet a ship goes much faster when it is moving with the wind. Now he was a humble clerk in an office when he suddenly realised that it might be better to assume there's no wind at all in space. He realised perhaps there just is no ether. Now how did he do that? He couldn't have learnt that at school. Einstein thought by imagination. He used mathematics, of course, as he had been taught. But he also imagined the strange mathematics that he needed to explain his new idea. He also used to say that he saw things in his head. He could imagine how space and time could become elastic to expand and contract depending on how we move within it. Yet, Einstein was not a high flyer at school. He even failed one of his university examinations. Let's take another example, because the same was true of that great genius, Leonardo da Vinci. He must have faced the unknown because he was not highly educated. In fact, by his letters, we know that he struggled to understand the common language of educated people in his time, which was Latin. In fact, far from being a highly educated man, he was a very practical man. He learned his skills in sculpture and painting as an apprentice. He also learned how to dissect the body and how to build bridges and make canals. He must have been an assiduous apprentice to all the people he learned his skills from. But he also had something in common with Einstein. He had imagination. Because before he worked on a great piece of art, like The Last Supper, or the Mona Lisa, he would sketch his ideas as they came to him. Where did those ideas come from? Certainly not from talking with his mum and dad. In fact, in a letter, he describes his great fear once when hiking in the hills, he came across a dark cave and he wrote, these are his words, Bending back and forth, I tried to see whether I could discover anything inside. But the darkness within prevented that. And suddenly, there arose within me two contrary emotions, fear and desire. Fear of the threatening dark cave, but desire to see whether there was any marvellous thing within it. And you know, desire won, and inside he discovered a fossil whale his interest in the anatomy of the body was kindled, and we know the rest. He became the greatest anatomist of his time. So, how do we learn imagination and how to use it? Well, the answer is very simple. We learn by doing it. Find time 
to let your mind wander. Find time for the imaginative arts like poetry, music and dance. Because if you experience the joy of the imaginative arts, you have a better chance of becoming an imaginative person yourself. In fact, many of the best ideas have come to people when they were not actually thinking about the problem itself. They sometimes come after they have thought deeply about the problem. Facing the unknown requires the courage to know that you have to let your mind do what it does naturally, which is imagine. There are many famous stories of scientists and artists struggling with problems. They're facing the unknown. And often it was only after sleeping on the problem that they came to see the solution. And I think that when we sleep on a problem, our mind continues to wander around in imagination looking for new ways of seeing things. What is dreaming if not letting the mind wander? We don't say we did a dream, we say we had a dream. So in a sense we didn't do it. What we did was to let our mind wander, dreaming is that. So, in addition to learning and deep study, include time for free-ranging mind-wandering. As Leonardo da Vinci shows, an idea in science, for example, may come from letting your mind do something quite different. And it works the other way too. Because when Charles Darwin wrote his great book, The Origin of Species, he often talked about the great beauty of nature. He wrote, and these are his words, There is a grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed into new forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. He would not have used that word beautiful if he had not appreciated and imagined beauty in art, music or dance. So to encourage imagination, let yourself become a rounded person. Certainly do what you want to do in life, but give time also to letting your mind feed on the ideas that come naturally. When, having thought deeply about something, you are stuck. That's the facing the unknown and the only way forward is to let your mind wander. So is science an art? Some people think that science and art are two quite different domains of life. I disagree. There is an art to science in the same sense as there's an art to discovery. But you don't learn it the way that you learn mathematics or physics or biology. The great thinkers and innovators in science cannot have done what they did simply by learning more because they had to face the unknown, something that is not yet known, and think of something that no one else had thought before. So you don't study imagination you just let your mind experience it. 
And that's why I advise giving time in life to poetry, music and dance. You can also do it by practicing meditation. You have a great and marvellous meditation tradition here in Korea. As an example, your great 7th century monk, Won Kyo, certainly knew the value of meditation in facing the unknown. Because I recently found that in one of his poems, he had actually anticipated modern ideas about relativity in biology. He could not have done that without letting his mind wander through the realm of the imagination. The famous Beatles singer John Lennon must have done that also when he wrote Imagine because he says himself that it was inspired by a poem that he happened to read in a book. If he hadn't read that poem, he wouldn't have written one of the most famous songs in the world. Imagine. That is facing the unknown. Kamsahamida.